Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the podcast. Today's episode is an important one. I'm doing this episode because we have a reading crisis in the United States that was exacerbated by the pandemic. The New York Times recently reported that the pandemic erased two decades of progress made in reading. There is so much that we can do. We have the knowledge and the science, but we need action. My guest today is Dr. Sally Shaywitz, and she is here today to discuss dyslexia. Dr. Shaywitz is the Audrey G. Ratner Professor in Learning Development at Yale University and co-founder and co-director of the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity. She is a world-renowned scientist and dedicated, compassionate physician who is devoted to bringing groundbreaking scientific advances to benefit dyslexic children and adults. Dr. Shaywitz and her team at Yale have been instrumental in identifying the neurobiological basis of unexpected difficulties in reading that is seen in dyslexia. She has followed 445 individuals longitudinally for about 39 years, and that has given her a unique opportunity to identify predictors of dyslexia and provide evidence for the need to screen dyslexia as early as first grade. I am thrilled that she's here to have this conversation with me. Millions of kids struggle with learning, processing, and social-emotional difficulties. These challenges interfere with their ability to reach their full potential. Dr. Karen Wilson is here to help. Her extensive background in pediatric neuropsychology and higher education have prepared her for this unique mission. Listen as she delivers content to inform, educate, and empower parents and educators. This will enable you to identify challenges that kids face and get them on the road to achieving their full potential. This is Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. Dr. Shaywitz, thank you so much for speaking with me today. You know, I've read your Overcoming Dyslexia book and the new edition. I've followed your research for years. And I just am so grateful for us having this conversation. This is our second conversation this week. And I'm glad that we're doing this for the podcast. Yes, I really enjoyed our first. Yes. You know, there are still so many misconceptions about dyslexia, regardless of decades of research. And I'd love for you to explain to parents and educators what dyslexia is. How do you define dyslexia? Okay, and that's an excellent question. Dyslexia, based on history and science, was defined in in legislation as an unexpected difficulty, an unexpected difficulty in reading in an individual who has the intelligence to be a much better reader. That is public law, the 21st century definition of dyslexia was passed in 2018 in Public Law 115-391. And in my book, it's on page 525. Wonderful, wonderful. Because I'm definitely going to put a link to your book in the show notes because I really think it's just such a valuable resource to parents, to educators, and to other clinicians who do these evaluations. Yes. And what's in- yeah, and what's interesting is this dyslexia is a specific learning disability. It is it is specific. And when they get the definition at school, it's specific learning disability, which is actually not specific, but dyslexia is specific. Yeah, you're so good, Karen. That's really the point. And there now, I actually testified uh, to Congress um, during the summer um, about dyslexia being a specific entity. Learning disability is very vague. Yes. You know, it's a mixture. It's well-intentioned, but it's very nonspecific. Dyslexia is very specific. And dyslexia accounts for 85 to 90 percent of all learning disabilities. Mm. And in dyslexia, we understand uh, where it is neurobiologically in the brain. And I'll go into that in a minute because it helps us understand some of the symptoms. And it's very specific. It's not vague. So, And I think eventually, I don't know how quick it will be, dyslexia will be defined um, as a very specific entity. 
one that parents and schools and policymakers really need to know about. Right. And right. that and that unexpected difficulty in reading, like you were saying, alluded to, has there's scientific validation for the neurobiological Yes, let me explain. We do um, brain imaging. Mm -hmm. And what we were able to learn is what the neural signature of dyslexia is. In typical readers, if you have them read, certain areas of the brain light up. Mm -hmm. Those areas are being activated on the left side and particularly uh, in the back of the brain. Okay? What happens in dyslexic readers is particularly a, a, re, a region in the occipital temporal region in the back of the brain, behind the ear, mm -hmm. and that area does not light up. Mm -hmm. Other areas do, secondary, ancillary in the front of the brain and some on the right side. And so what happens is in typical readers, you have the fast automatic route to reading. And reading is smooth and quick. In dyslexic readers, that, let's say, fast highway, pathway, right. is not available. So the dyslexic reader has to rely on secondary, ancillary routes. And, and they find them. But it's slow. It's not that fast. It's not automatic. Does that right. make sense to you? It absolutely makes sense. It's not efficient. And, That's right. you know, you were leading this research and identifying these brain regions and, you know, it's all about connectivity and they're, those regions connection to each other and to other areas of the brain. Yes, exactly. So, and the important thing about the de definition of dyslexia, and I'll just repeat it, is an unexpected difficulty in reading for an individual who has the intelligence to be a much better reader. So it becomes very important that educators, parents, and particularly the individual, him or herself, knows that. Yes. That they're an in intelligent person. So um, that becomes very important. It is so important. I think that's such an important piece because so many children and young people and even adults with dyslexia don't feel bright. They don't feel like they have the intellectual ability because of the experiences and the struggles that they've had with their dyslexia, particularly those who have not had it identified as dyslexia. They just don't understand what is happening and what, what it is. Yeah, well, that's why it's so important. And um, uh, I work together with my spouse. He's a child neurologist and I'm a, a, a behavioral pediatrician. So we try to bring together science, clinical information, and the person to see how what we can do. As, as humans, we are programmed to speak. So when a mother gives birth to a child in the hospital, you say, oh, I'll get you the speech handbook. <laughs> but you might think, oh, given that dyslexia affects one out of five, you know, look out for the reading. So, so people who are dyslexic are very common in all parts of the world. Books that I've written have been translated into Chinese, Japanese, Korean, um, uh, Portuguese, etc. Mm -hmm. So it's it's very common and. The consequences are very similar. They're underestimated. Yes. And particularly uh, the most traumatic thing that happens to a dyslexic child in school often is to be called on to read aloud. Yes. You know, people make fun of them and, you know, oh my, you can't read, et cetera. Or the teacher will say, "Oh, how can you not? How can you not read that?" And so, this 21st century definition of dyslexia as unexpected is very important because it establishes that as a dyslexic, 
You can be very bright and yet read slowly. Yes. You do not have to score below a certain level of reading. It's more how you go about reading, the manner in which you read, how long it takes you to read. That's so important. And that is, I love that you brought that up, that point, because it's really the efficiency with which you read. And that's connected to what you described regarding the neural signature of dyslexia and that inefficient system in the brain. Exactly. So it doesn't have anything to do with knowledge, no intelligence, et cetera. Right. Their brains are wired differently. That's right. And, And the good news is that your research has also shown that there are effective reading interventions. Yes. Even though individuals will continue to be dyslexic, there are things that we can do to but address I'll, this issue. I'd love for you to talk about that. Yes. But the most important is for the person to be identified yes. as having dyslexia. And that is best done by screening. Screening means evaluating the child. Hopefully, early on, when we saw the data, what we did is we actually developed an evidence-based screener. Mm -hmm. When I was asked as a clinician and professor at Yale uh, in pediatrics to see children whose parents particularly were, were concerned about how they were struggling to read, and I tried to read the literature. And it wasn't very helpful. So what we did is we developed a screener, Mm -hmm. an evidence-based screener that can be used to determine if the child is at risk or just like it doesn't diagnose, but it's very important because Mm -hmm. it's is this child at risk? Right. And we developed it, and Pearson has it. And you know how long our study has been going on? Since probably for almost 39, 40 years, 39 years? Good for you. (laughs) That's right. And why that's important is we've been collecting data Mm -hmm. every year. So we have data on typical readers over time. and we have data on dyslexic readers. Right. And what's so important is, for example, I get calls from parents frequently. I'm so concerned about my child's reading. Uh, he or she is in second grade or first grade, and I tell the teacher, and the teacher says, oh, don't worry, that's too early. Mm-hmm. Never click in until third grade or fourth grade, etc. Oh, no. And the parent doesn't know what to do, and often they'll call me. And what we have is we have documented reading progress from first grade through adulthood in both typical readers and in dyslexic readers. And you know what we were able to find? We were able to find and show that the achievement gap between typical and dyslexic readers occurs as early as first grade Mm -hmm. and persists. In my book, if you look on page 141, you'll see the graphs. Mm -hmm. And you could see that at first grade already, there's a division. Right. And so it occurs. And, and that's really so important, and it persists. And it also shows a very, very important reason to identify risks early. And that is because reading growth is maximal in the first few years. The angle of acceleration of reading growth is most acute in first grade, second grade, third grade, but then you know what happens? It begins to flatten out. Mm -hmm. So you need to identify children at risk for dyslexia early. 
So children need to be screened early, kindergarten, first, second, third grade, because you may still identify them later, but you'll have missed the opportunity right. to offer them maximal reading growth. Right. And this is why I always argue that we need to identify, we can't have this wait, wait and see approach when kids are in first and second grade to see if it will magically you know, resolve itself. Because like you said, we have the research to show that these gaps don't go away on their own, that you actually have to intervene with intense instruction that is of sufficient duration. And that has come out of your research. But That is correct. Reading growth is maximal the first few years of school. Mm -hmm. And then it plateaus. So that that's very important. So in the Shaywood's dyslexia screen, we we ask the teachers very few questions, grades kindergarten two and three, 10 questions, grade one, 12 questions. It takes the teacher five to 10 minutes. And but it's the teacher who's been trying to teach the child to read. So we want to enlist that teacher's insights about their students. We want to reach children at risk of dyslexia early on. Mm -hmm. But reading intervention is maximally effective before students fall further and further behind. Early on is when the slope for learning is greatest and it's best to identify at risk and provide intervention. Don't wait. That's the message. Don't wait with time. The slope flattens. And right. improvement in reading is much much slower. And that's in overcoming dyslexia on pages 169 to 173. Yes. And what we're finding as well is NAEP, National Assessment of Educational Progress, mm -hmm. we're doing worse mm. in identifying the, the country's poorest uh, performing students. They're scoring worse than they have in previous years. Right. So that's why we developed the Shaywood, I, I, I feel awkward saying it, <laughs> but that's what it's called, the Shaywood's Dyslexia Screen. It's evidence-based, and it also follows Public Law 115-391, which defines dyslexia. It also defines what a dyslexia screening program is. And it states that the term dyslexia screening program means a screening program for dyslexia that is evidence-based with proven psychometrics for validity, efficient and low cost, and readily available. And you could read about it more on pages 170 and mm -hmm. 171. Because your goal is to find children most at risk for dyslexia to target them for extra help as early as possible. And because it's so brief and efficient and available, it can be used and it is used for universal screening. Right. And it engages the child's teacher who knows the child's best. And what your goal is, is to identify a pool of children who are at risk for dyslexia. It's completed on a tablet and it's diagnosed at the end, the teacher will see, dichotomize, yes, this child is at risk for dyslexia, and no, this child is not at risk. It has very strong psychometrics. It's evidence-based. It's extremely efficient, about five to 10 minutes per child, and inexpensive. So, mm -hmm. um, and the items emphasize what's important in learning to read academic, phonologic, and linguistic performance. So it's totally digital and automatic, and it's area under the curve, which is the standard criterion for evaluating the quality of your screening instruments, called the AUC. It has very, very strong, the goal is to have a strong performing screener with AUC in the 0.7 to 0.8, range, and on the Shaywood's dyslexia screen, the AUC for kindergarten is 0.81 and already in first grade, 0.89. So it indicates that the screener 
is very strong and accurate in separating children at risk for dyslexia from those not at risk. So, and I, mm-hmm. and I feel like a universal screener, the one that is evidence based, like you have described, is really the answer to the national epidemic that we have of reading failure and the reading crisis that has just persisted beyond. COVID-19. And it was it was there before. It just got exacerbated by the pandemic. And yeah. all of these new numbers are coming out showing, you know, that the results of testing are showing how devastating the last two years have been, particularly for nine-year-old school children. Yeah. And we're still seeing that 67% of fourth graders are reading below grade level. That's disgraceful. It is. But it's not necessary. Because we know how to screen how to identify at risk, and how to intervene. Right. So it's inexcusable. And and we, you know, and you know, because uh, you've heard me say, <laughs> I don't have a knowledge gap. We have an action gap. Yes. And since there are so many children and adults affected, one out of five, it's one of the most common problems we have. And we know the answer. And we don't act on it. Mm-hmm. That's disgusting. That's unethical. It really is. And it's interesting because I've watched what's happening, what has happened with pediatric mental health and how we have, we're now getting to the point we have universal screening for depression and anxiety. And I don't understand, given the significant research that we have behind dyslexia, dyslexia that we don't do the same because it has outcomes that are very similar to anxiety. For kids who are not identified yes. early on. Yeah, let me just tell you, you're so good. I'm glad you brought this up. One, about half the kids that have dyslexia have ADHD. Mm-hmm. Similarly, half the kids that have ADHD will have dyslexia. But a very large proportion of children who are dyslexic have anxiety. Yes. Fear anxiety. Oh, are they going to call me to read aloud? Who's going to make fun of me? Why am I stupid when they're not? So I really, um, I, I, you know, if you have any suggestions, <laughs> the better. Uh, I'm totally open because the knowledge is there. Yes. And that's the frustrating thing is that we have the knowledge. We have the scientific evidence of dyslexia and how to intervene, but it's the implementation of the interventions that is the issue. Exactly. Well, the implementation of the screening. Yes. The intervention. And also just you should be aware in my book, Overcoming Dyslexia, chapter 30 is labeled anxiety, ADHD, Mm. dyslexia. Yes, I see it. I see it all the time. Yeah, it's really Son John, who's a psychiatrist, to grow up with me as your mother, you had. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what you also say in your book, and I think it's important for for parents to hear, particularly those who see the struggles in their child, and sometimes it's easy to hyper focus on the struggles. But you write in your book that when you talk about individuals with dyslexia, you also note that they are intuitive, they excel at problem solving, seeing the big picture. And simplifying, they feast on visualizing, abstract thinking, and thinking out the box. Yes, they have to yes. And what happens? These strengths are deep and meaningful. Yes, like having a broken leg where it's visible mm-hmm. to everybody. Yes, and I think what that says is that yes, you can have these symptoms of dyslexia that will persist, but they don't have to interfere with success if we can intervene and get individuals the support they need. Good for you. I am a big fan of yours, Karen. I'm a big fan of yours as well, because it feels like you have, we have all the solutions to this crisis. We just have to, again, address the action gap. Yeah, well, I'm hopeful. As I said, I testified to Congress about having dyslexia be in its own category, which means that hopefully it would be taught more to teachers of the mm-hmm. education and be more part of policy. Because 
a lot of schools aren't even allowed to use the word. I know. It's unbelievable. It's like saying a, a special hospital can't use the word cancer. <laughs> right. It's, 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 it's really, I, I think if we can screen the children mm-hmm. on first or second grade, identify who's at risk, because then you also know who's not at risk. Right. And focus on the children at risk. You can do so much good. So much good. And because we know that the outcomes for students who can't read and who never get the intervention um, is poorer. It's poor. And what we're doing too now Mm -hmm. is listening prisons. Yes. And I, when I first saw these data, I didn't believe it. But about half the prisoners are dyslexic. And not only that, they're smart. Mm. But they gave up on themselves because the school gave up on them. And, um, and we're working um, uh, with some people um, about this. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dr. Laura Cassidy. Uh, uh, particularly because to have so many prisoners dyslexic Mm -hmm. when the people who are dyslexic are so smart I should also tell you um, and I think it just came out today I was invited you know what have you ever heard of Coursera that plot it's a platform for knowledge sharing knowledge correct right it's like um programs for college courses and they have them in a full range of courses last year Coursera total not any specific course had 92 million viewers mm-hmm. and guess what I was invited to do the Coursera on dyslexia oh brilliant and and guess what it comes out today oh my goodness okay I have to get the link from you so I can Go to Coursera. I can go to Coursera and get it. Okay, I will go there and get the link. The course is called Overcoming Dyslexia. As it should be. (laughs) Right. As it should be. Right. Right. And and just to tell you, so many, you know, I I want people to know that you can be dyslexic and and your dreams can come true. Absolutely. A couple of the people who are in our Coursera, you ready? Yes, tell me. Have you ever heard of someone called Gavin Newsom? Oh, yes. Our he, governor. He's the dyslexic and he's an our boss and he talks about how he approached dyslexia. Okay? Yes. And um, to, Dr. Toby Cosgrove, who was rejected, he's in my book, who, he was rejected from eight out of ten medical schools when he applied. Mm-hmm. Guess what? He became a cardiac surgeon. And he headed the clinic, which was the top cardiac hospital in the country. He's recently retired. And uh, you ever hear of an attorney named David Boyce? B O no. mm-hmm. He's he's very very respected, and he's dyslexic. So, and um, I, I'll just tell you a little anecdote. So, I got a call one day from um, a surgeon at Yale who. Uh, works with athletic teams, professional athletic teams. Mm-hmm. And he said, there's someone who really would like to be evaluated to see if they're dyslexic. Mm-hmm. He's the manager of a professional basketball team. I said, sure. And we evaluated him. And of course, you know, he was. And arranged them to have very good tutoring. And you know why he wanted to be evaluated? Mm-hmm. Did he have a child who struggled? Well, you, you're halfway, halfway there. Okay. He had a, a young child who asked him to read her story. Oh. Mm. And he felt, I get the chills when I say that. Mm. And he felt so badly that he couldn't. And he calls me very frequently. He said, I'm so happy I can read her stories now. Oh, my goodness. So there's a lot of reasons why people should do what we discussed. So Absolutely. And Absolutely. It, it's screening, screening and intervention and making sure that parents and teachers are knowledgeable about and the child, what dyslexia is. And the child, absolutely. child to know that they, they have this, 
you can be very smart and successful. Wonderful. You know, Dr. Shaywitz, I really appreciate all the work that you've done in this field and all the work that you have yet to do and we have yet to do. And I just thank you for your time today. It was a wonderful conversation. I think it's going to impact a lot of parents. You know, when I make a diagnosis of dyslexia, I see, you know, parents really struggle with hearing that word. But when I show them your research and show them pictures of the brain before and after intervention, there's hope. And there's a motivation for them to provide their children and advocate for their children at, at school to make sure they get the support. So I, again, thank you for all the work that you do. Well, thank you. And you know what? We have to keep in touch. Absolutely. We will. We'll absolutely do that. Okay. Thank you so much. And good Thank luck. you so much for being here. I hope you found this podcast episode helpful. And I hope that it actually has you a little bit fired up. We have integrated Dr. Shaywitz's research into our Dyslexia Parent Learning Group that begins in 2023. We know, as Dr. Shaywitz indicated, 50% of kids with dyslexia also have ADHD, and many also experience anxiety. So if you register for the Dyslexia Learning Group, you can attend the ADHD and Anxiety Parent Learning Groups at no extra charge. We are limiting each group to 15 parents. So go to the show notes, click on the link for parent groups and reserve your spot or go to bit.ly backslash child nexus parent groups. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Diverse Thinking, Different Learning by Child Nexus. For more resources, visit us online at childnexus.com. 